All right, Ling441, we've got one more lecture to go through before we uh, wrap things up for the semester, and this one is gonna be on speech synth synthesis. Um, yeah, so this is uh, kind of a mostly for fun lecture, but I think by going through the various forms of speech synthesis or synth synthetic speech, uh, we can kind of remind ourselves of some of the basic principles of articulatory and acoustic phonetics that we've learned throughout the semester. Uh, so with uh, no further ado, once again, uh, let's get into it. So um, speech synthesis, generally speaking, is the generation of speech by machine rather than how it's normally produced by human beings. Um, and the reasons for studying synthetic speech have evolved over the years. Uh, so um, you could say you might just want to produce synthetic speech to see if you can. Uh, it's something new and different. Um, a more sort of scientific reason to uh, look at this is to control acoustic cues and perceptual studies and we've seen examples of that from the pattern playback synthesis, uh, synthesis machine that was used in the Haskins labs experiments on categorical perception and so on and so forth back in the 50s um, but you can still use this with more sophisticated forms of speech synthesis uh, in the modern day uh, although it maybe isn't as um, common to do so as it used to be because um, well as we'll see as we walk through the, these lecture notes, synthetic speech is always um, processed or perceived as having basically a, a deficit as being not natural um, and not quite as good as natural human speech. Uh, but it's still, it is still a way to kind of control uh, what you're presenting to listeners if you want to. You can also use it to understand the human articulatory system. So there is a um, there's another model of, or another theory of speech perception, which is called analysis by synthesis. Um, and this is kind of relevant here. So this model, where I'm not gonna go into it in depth, it's kind of closely related to the motor theory of speech perception in that you're trying to understand what people say by knowing how they would actually produce what they said, um, except it's a more mathematically oriented model, um, which makes the computations quite, uh, well, they quickly become quite challenging and complex, but it's like the motor theory idea that you understand what people are saying by understanding how they produced it. Um, so if you generate synthetic speech, you can kind of get a better sense of um, what people actually do uh, when they do produce speech to see if you can get it right mechanically, um, rather than just listing what people are doing or taking some other sort of data from their articulations. There's also, aside from the science part of this, or maybe the artistry of it, <clears throat> There is a obvious practical application uh, which the, you can uh, create reading machines that can go from text to speech. Um, and this is useful for people who are maybe blind or you want to use for navigation systems. I think we may have all encountered this to a certain extent with um, using uh, modern systems like Siri or what have you. Um, you can, I'll show you an example of how you can do this with a Macintosh um, for anything uh, here halfway through those lecture notes as well. I know that uh, Darren Flynn, who doesn't, um, he reads a lot, even though he doesn't have a lot of time for reading. And one of the ways he does that is he um, just uses a text-to-speech synthesizer uh, and has the computer read things out to him as he's like driving around, uh, as he takes the kids to whatever activities they're going to or what have you. Um, yeah, so there's applications for this and I think we've also say uh, actually I haven't heard this for a while but for a while they were using a form of synthetic speech to sort of make the announcements at like the C train stations um, I've heard it for like weather announcements so on and so forth there's lots of ways you can use this uh, the question is though how do you actually make it work how do you produce speech synthesis or synthesize speech there are four basic types of synthetic speech uh, so there the first one uh, which is <clears throat> kind of impractical and therefore not commonly used, but it was the first kind of uh, synthetic speech is called mechanical synthesis. Um, and this is basically using a machine or some sort of device, which is not electronic in nature to produce um, synthetic speech. We'll see some examples here uh, in a bit. Uh, the second kind is formant synthesis, which is synthetic speech that's basically based on source filter theory, where you produce some sort of uh, electronic sound or electric, electrically based sound, which is the source of your speech. And then you apply some sort of filters, again, through electrical engineering is largely the way this was always done, uh, to sort of filter that source sound and make it sound like speech overall. Thirdly, there's uh, concatenative synthesis, which is where you record natural speech 
and then you chop it up into little pieces and then pe put those pieces back together again into something that sounds like natural speech. <clears throat> you don't have to sort of create concatenative, syn concatenative synthesis from scratch in the same way you would say formant synthesis or mechanical synthesis. You use human beings to do that for you, uh, but then you uh, pick and choose wherever you need to to create the whole um, for whatever kind of um, utterance you might want the synthesizer to produce. Lastly, there is articulatory synthesis, and this is kind of the one that's most relevant to that analysis by synthesis idea, where you generate speech from a model of the vocal tract. So to kind of make the contrast clear, formant synthesis is based on essentially an acoustic model of how speech is produced. Um, mechanical synthesis, you're actually producing a device, a mechanical device that produces the speech um, in the same way, it's like a robot basically. Um, and articulatory synthesis is a model, so it can be computational, and we'll see an example that's used in Prot. Uh, but it's an, a, mo a model of how the actual articulators uh, move around when you're speaking, and then you go from those articulations to the acoustics, which hopefully sound like speech by the time you get to the end of the process. Okay, we'll see examples of all these, so I don't want to dwell on the overview uh, that much, but hopefully you get the basic idea. Okay, so like I said, the very first attempts to produce synthetic speech were made without electricity, uh, and these are called uh, forms of mechanical synthesis. So in the oldest example I know of uh, comes from the late 1700s, um, where models were produced which used reeds as a voicing source, and then they had differently shaped tubes for different vowels, and you might recall that we have already seen such models uh, they were used in that um, sort of perturbation theory demo with the tubes and the duck call at one end of the open tube and the tube had different shapes. So to remind you, they sounded like this. That was our duck call. That was like the source of our sound. And then we had different tubes that were shaped differently for different vowels for, you know, something like that. Um, these were the original shapes of the tubes that were used in the sort of development of this form of synthesis, I guess the guy who did this was named Kratzenstein. Kratzenstein. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he's probably German um, of some form. And uh, his tubes don't really look much at all like the tubes that we played around with for that uh, perturbation theory demo. Um, and it would be interesting to see how well they work. I don't have good demos of what these actually sound like, but these are the vowels that they're supposed to line up with. Yeah, this is one way to give it a whirl. Um, Later on, uh, another guy with a very German sounding name, um, Wolfgang von, von Kempelen and Charles Wheatstone created a more sophisticated mechanical speech device that had independently manipulable source and filter mechanisms. And this thing's uh, pretty elaborate and also looks pretty cool. <clears throat> I kind of wish I had one. I kind of wish I could speak a little more easily today. I don't know what's going on. But anyways, uh, you can kind of look at this as like a just a mechanical model of what happens mechanically when human beings speak. So at this end, we have the bellows. Remember going way back, we talked about how we get air out of our lungs. So in this case, you're just pushing air out of the bellows. They're like your lungs. Um, then they that has to go through basically a larynx or some sort of source generation device. Um, so there's a reed here as well, and the when you blow air through the reed, it will vibrate, hopefully at the appropriate frequency. Uh, but then it has also different sources, um, different devices for producing sort of fricative noise. So uh, these are different sources of sound. There's an S lever, there's an S lever, uh, there's whistles as well. I guess this is, you know, the lever opens up the whistle maybe, and when the air blows out, it sounds like an S when it blows through that. Uh, then it has uh, a little tube here, which is basically um, supposed to represent like the vocal tract. Um, not entirely sure what the auxiliary bellows do, but here's kind of a close up of what's happening with the vocal tract. So here's our reed, which is producing the source of this sound. Uh, air is coming in through this from the lungs or the bellows. Um, and then it goes through this sort of leather tube, I guess you would call it, which you can sort of compress in the appropriate way to produce specific vowels. There's a little uh, escape hatch here for the nostrils in case you want to make um, nasal sounds. I'm not entirely sure how you open or close that, but it's there in case you need it. And it looks like there's two here because we have two nostrils, right? 
Um, yeah, so, or maybe that's what the auxiliary bellows are for, just to blow air through your nose. Who knows? Uh, but this is quite an elaborate device, and it would be fun to see how well it would actually work. Uh, and this is one way to kind of, rec you know, recreate the system that human beings have naturally for speech. Yeah. Uh, there's another way to do this, uh, which I don't recommend, but I still find kind of hilarious. Um, I guess it depends on how you feel about dogs exactly. But uh, Alexander Graham Bell, famous inventor. He invented the telephone, as hopefully we all know. Um, he, uh, he was born in Scotland. He... Um, wound up inventing the telephone when he was living in Massachusetts, but then he spent most of his uh, final years in Nova Scotia. If you ever get out that way, I would recommend checking out his home. It's a historical museum, it's kind of cool. He did a lot of things after um, inventing the telephone. He got really interested in kites uh, somehow, uh, which I guess is what you do when you can become rich and famous and you're kind of you know, a creative thinker. You can just play around with whatever you want. Uh, another thing he did, uh, so uh, anyway, the point of me giving you that little tour is that he's claimed at the end of the day as uh, somebody who's both, uh, or not both, but he's somebody who's supposed to be Scottish, American, and Canadian. Everybody wants to have him because he invented the telephone. But deep down inside, he was a phonetician. Um, he came from a family of um, phoneticians or multiple generations of phoneticians, which is kind of how he got interested in the uh, telephone to begin with. Uh, so another thing he did in his old age, um, aside from playing around with kites, was that he had a dog, uh, and he would try to get the dog to speak, as it were. So what he would apparently do is place his dog between, he, he'd be sitting down on a chair, he'd place his dog in between his knees, and then he'd kind of squeeze the sides of the dog with his knees to get it to start growling. And then he'd put his fingers in the dog's mouth and try to shape the dog's mouth uh, according to how he knew the mouth was shaped for different human speech sounds. And then the dog would start to say something like, I love you, or whatever, right? We've seen that all before. Uh, so, yeah, that's one way to do it. But again, not really recommended. Um, it's just kind of a fun historical footnote. Uh, and I also say that most people don't do or create this type of synthetic speech anymore just because it's, um, it's time consuming and difficult. Um, there was a guy uh, at Indiana when I was there a while back by the name of Mike Brady who gave this a shot uh, by creating a robot which can mechanically produce speech, uh, or at least that was the idea, that's the wrong folder. Uh, so let's see if we can watch this. Yep, here we go. Uh, so this is from a while back. I don't know how much further he's progressed with this. We'll see how impressed you are. This is not a dog, it's not a tube attached to bellows, it's a robot. So there's a little footnote about babble training, and I think what he's doing is trying to get the robot to just like learn what the possibilities are for articulation and then get some sort of feedback and on the basis of the feedback of like how well what it's babbling matches up with you know the output goal um he can try to get it to be like trained in the same way that like babies learn how to speak try to try to match up um their speech with those of adults uh so this is uh, after that training um the robot trying to produce a specific phrase uh, I needed to skip a little part there so you didn't see what the phrase is. I'm going to let this play and maybe you can guess what the robot is trying to say. Let's go say it more than once. Sorry. Did you understand that? Probably not. Um, but you see what it says here. Welcome to Cognitive Robotics at Indiana University. Okay, so when you know what it's trying to say, you can kind of hear the appropriate prosody in there. But like I said, this is challenging. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of work that went in this. 
uh, and it's still only at this point in development. So this is why people, a lot of people shy away from this because um, it's hard. Uh, but he was able to give the robot a nose and two eyes. So that's pretty good. Um, yeah. Other than that, after sort of these initial attempts at mechanical synthesis, uh, people will, electronics started becoming uh, more common. Um, so the first sort of famous attempt at generating speech electronically was uh, what was called the voter. And this was a system that was, I believe, developed by Bell Labs, which is why you can see the logo here. This is familiar to somebody of my age, but maybe not yours. Uh, but, you know, so Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone that became a very profitable invention over time. Uh, he did that in 1876. So 63, layers, 63 years later, it was a massively profitable company that could spend money on just researching things for fun and also potential for future profit. And one of the things they created for the New York World's Fair in 1939 was this machine called the Voter. Um, so the New York World's Fair in 1939, in case you don't know, was this fair that was all about the future and about new technology that would come our way and make our lives wonderful and easy, so on and so forth. I'll leave it to you to decide whether that's actually happened. It's kind of funny in retrospect that this happened in 1939, or ex not exactly funny, but um, it happened right before World War II broke out, so they didn't really see that coming. But they were able to create this machine, which inspired a lot of future attempts at speech synthesis uh, in the following years. So the voter, uh, it was generating speech electronically, the actual sounds, but it had to be manually control controlled. Um, and what that means is they actually um, had female employees, which they hired explicitly for this purpose, uh, and they trained them to uh, play this machine or control this machine, whatever you want to say for it. Um, I'll show you what it, how it works on the next slide, but it kind of works like playing a very complicated organ, um, you could say. Uh, and they hired women to learn how to do this, and not every single young woman was able to uh, figure out how to do it. Some were better than others, so they kept the ones that were really good. And this is a demo from the World's Fair 81 years ago in which uh, one of these... Um, Highly, high, highly trained young women operates the machine uh, in kind of amazingly fluent fashion. For example, Helen, will you have the voters say, she saw me, uh, that sounded awfully flat. How about a little expression? Say the sentence in answer to these questions. Who saw you? She saw me. Whom did she see? She saw me. Well, did she see you or hear you? Now, so far, you have only heard the voter speak in one voice. But the voter has other voices which he can use when Miss Harper makes a simple adjustment in his mechanism. Helen, will you have the voter say, Greetings, everybody? Greetings, everybody. Now, will you have him repeat that in a high voice? Greetings, everybody. And now, in his best face. Greetings, everybody. Yeah, so you can hear that's mostly a demo about uh, controlling pitch and prosody, right? So you can sort of move the pitch up and down to get more male sounding voices or more female sounding voices. Um, also, she was playing around with where she was placing the emphasis or the pitch accents in the utterance too. Uh, we can listen to this one a little bit. All right, maybe that was good enough. <laughs> so that one's two and a half minutes long. Um, all right, how did the voter work? Uh, so the voter uh, basically operated like a vocoder. We saw in principle what vocoders are able to do or the principles behind them um, when we were playing around with uh, cochlear implant simulations in the uh, lecture on audition. Uh, at the time, I promised you that uh, I had a clip of the band Daft Punk, which uses a uh, vocoder in their music often. Uh, here's that, one, that clip that I should have played for you a while ago but it sounds like this when they play it. All right, so they have a huge advantage over the operators of the voter from 80 years ago because they can do a lot of this electronically with computers and whatnot. Um, the voter is working again, like a sort of source filter mechanism. Um, so you can see that there are 
electronic sources of sound over here. Uh, and then the operator would use a wrist bar to kind of turn those sources on and off. Remember, this is before a computer, so they don't just have like a keyboard they can play around with. Um, and then there is what's called resonance control here, which is like the filter of the source sound. Uh, and then there are 10 different keys for uh, the fingers of the person playing around with this. So and I guess this one's offset a little bit for their thumbs. Um, but they're basically pushing down keys when they want specific frequencies or frequency ranges to resonate more. Um, so if you can imagine that playing this in a style and at a speed that makes it sound like speech, you have to mess around with your fingers. Again, it's a lot more complicated than just playing a piece of music, um, even though music can be challenging enough, right? Uh, then there's different keys here for producing different kinds of stops, I guess, both voiceless and voiced. Um, after your source goes through, oh, there's a pitch control pedal too, um, to raise and lower uh, the pitch. After the source goes through this filtering um, of whatever sort, it goes to an amplifier which plays it. So it's basically, again, the idea behind our source filter theory of speech, except it's all done electronically. Um, yeah, so each one of these 10 different resonators is controlled by an individual finger. This is what it looked like when they were actually trying to play it. Uh, as it were, and I guess these are, so these are the different sort of frequency keys for the various fingers. Here's are the, um, the stop buttons here in the middle. Uh, the, you control the pitch with your pedal, and this, I guess, is your wrist bar, which controls the source sound. So isn't that cool? Um, only about one in 10 of the women they hired to uh, play this thing were actually able to do it. So. This it takes a special ability, I guess, uh, and then it also takes a lot of practice in order to get it to sound like speech. So it's cool, but again, it's impractical. But in 1939, you know, it could shock the world. All right, so after people took care of what they needed to take care of in World War II, they got back into sort of more frivolous things like um, speech synthesis. So uh, the pattern playback is an example we've seen before. This was, so the spectrograph came out of World War II and the pattern playback is basically a reverse spectrograph. So they were uh, initially able to develop this, I think in the late, either early 50s, late 40s. Uh, and I've walked you through how um, this works again, but it's basically trying to invert the process of making spectrograms by shining light through um, kind of a rolling piece of cellophane that has spectrograms um, painted on it. So the sort of paintings of the spectrogram frequencies as they change over time um, will sort of that information will be transmitted to an amplifier by these light collectors here down at the bottom of the system. So they will, will respond with different amounts of voltage based on how, many, how much light shines into them. Um, so if you're shining a light through the spectrogram, they will sort of respond to those patterns and th that voltage will be transmitted to um, free, or Resonators set at different frequencies here in an amplifier, uh, which will be played out of a loudspeaker. And it will sound like this. And now that you've heard that before, you probably know it says these days a chicken leg is a rare dish. Um, but it, the, again, the idea at this point was to just use speech synthesis to determine which cues were the best cues for particular sounds or try to figure out how people respond to specific acoustic cues. Uh, again, controlling at a very fine level what the acoustic structure of a sound was in order to figure out how the people produce it or perceive it, sorry. Um, yeah, however, as we've talked about before, the exact uh, control they have over the acoustics here is limited because they're just painting these things on a piece of cellophane. So it's not like, um, it obviously doesn't sound like human speech exactly, right? It's easy to tell the the world. So there's still some ways to go before that can really meaningfully be applied to um, the study of speech perception. Uh, but that's the best they had at the time. So that's what they went with. Um, the next kind of synthesis that was developed after this um, is called formant synthesis. So um, this is a synthesizer called PAT, which stands for Parametric Artificial Talker. Uh, and as I just mentioned, it's a parallel formant synthesizer. So um, 
here's kind of the block diagram for how this is supposed to work. So you take a source signal, which sounds like this. That's too loud. Um, sorry. Um, and then, or maybe it sounds like this. Uh, and so this is a parallel formant synthesizer. Uh, and maybe you remember this from studying how electricity works in physics class. Maybe you don't, it doesn't really matter, but um, you take the source here and you kind of split that source sound into, into three separate pathways. I believe the A here stands for amplifier. So you're either, you're amplifying um, basically different formants here. This is where it got the name of formant synthesizer. Uh, and so, you split the source into basically three different directions and then you apply a resonating filter to that source um, using uh, whatever electric, electrical uh, wizardry to do that. But these formants can be set to specific frequencies with different bandwidths. And after splitting them up, the original signal up into three paths, you can recombine it again at the end. Uh, and then at uh, the end of the day, it's supposed to sound like speech after sort of going through this sort of uh, source filter process again. Uh, yeah, so I didn't kind of give you guys a heads up there. I'll turn it up a bit again. Can you tell me what's being said in this utterance? It's not the greatest recording because when you listen to it closely, it sounds like there's like another uh, recording going on in the background, just a bit fainter. Uh, but what it's trying to say is this. What did you say before that? Tea or coffee? What have you done with it? What did you say before that? Tea or coffee? What have you done with it? Yeah. So again, once you know what it's saying, um, you can kind of get a sense uh, of how to process future versions of the same type of synthesis. Um, but it's not easy from scratch. Uh, usually people get about 50% of this um, when I play it in class. Uh, this is what a spectrogram looks like from this machine. What did you say before that? Which is nice. You can kind of see these individual formants changing over time. And it looks, at least in spectrogram form, like what we're used to seeing in natural human speech. Um, yeah, so another formant synthesizer was... I don't know if it's Ove or Ove, because it's built by a Swedish, again, a Swedish phonetician, Gunnar Font, who, we, who we've met before. Um, but this one was a cascade formant synthesizer. And when I learned about these circuits back in the old days, uh, we called this serial uh, rather than parallel. So in this case, you take um, a source signal. <clears throat> this is called gain here rather than amplification, I guess, because it's electricity. And uh, then you, um, plop it through the first formant filter and you know set it to a specific frequency and bandwidth there, then the second formant, then the third formant in a row like this, and at the end you get speech. How are you? I love you. And maybe that's a little bit easier to understand, but this is again sort of like our uh, talking cats and dogs from that other previous lecture. Um, when it says things that uh, are familiar and that we want to hear, it's easier to understand what it's saying. How are you? I love you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so in the 50s and 60s, uh, there was a kind of debate about whether parallel or cascade synthesis was better uh, when we were generating speech from scratch in this fashion. Uh, and this is apparently the result of some contest they had where they were trying to tune each system to kind of say something really specific uh, to find out which one could do it better. I'll let you listen to these um, and you can let me know what you think. Welcome to the Stockholm Speech Communication Seminar. Or maybe you can let yourself know what you think because you're probably watching this alone, or at least not with me. Welcome to the Stockholm Speech Communication Seminar. Yeah, so this sounds pretty good, right? Welcome to the Stockholm Speech Communication Seminar. At least maybe compared to this. How are you? I love you. So there's potential there, but eventually, uh, apparently it required a lot of work to get it to that um, level of quality. Uh, the ultimate goal is to be able to get machines to generate speech automatically without all of that manual intervention, because if you have to spend week and weeks and weeks working on one sentence, it's sort of not worth your time other than just as a demo. Uh, so the idea here is to get synthesis by rule, or, or like you can think of this in terms of like a computer program or algorithm. 
Um, so here's a, an attempt on the uh, pattern playback, um, which I guess used rules to just generate the patterns of um, format frequencies that they were painting on the uh, piece of cellophane or I, what have you. I find it this player will without looking at a spectrogram. Can you understand it? And I think I have the text here. Yeah. I painted this by rule without looking at a spectrogram. Can you understand it? I painted this by rule without looking at a spectrogram. Can you understand it? Okay. Maybe you can understand it, maybe you can't. Um, I've heard it a lot, so it's easier for me to interpret it. Um, but that's what it sounded like when they were just generating synthesis by rule. I'm also going to add a note here, which I thought about before, um, which is that the pattern playback was the only synthesis system. It was the first synthesis system, and it was the only synthesis system to um, basically not modulate F0 as it uh, produced speech. I find this player will without looking at a spectrogram. Can you understand it? Which is why that's a nice flat monotone. Um, so the funny thing about this is that ever since when people want to sort of imitate synthetic speech or robotic speech or what have you, they will typically use a flat F0 to do so. I painted this by rule without looking at a spectrogram, right? I think we've all heard that before. Um, but every single successive attempt to create synthetic speech has been able to tweak F0 in some sort of meaningful way and also not so bad way when you compare it to human speech. Here's an attempt from 1961. This used a computer to calculate the rules for synthetic speech. It's hard for us to imagine that way back in the 50s, uh, people were able to sort of go through complicated algorithms without using a computer at all, but they did. Um, but again, that's not super efficient. Um, let's see what a computer does when it's faced with the same task. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer to. I'm half crazy, all for the love of you. It yeah, I don't know if we need to listen to all of that. Uh, but uh, if you... Um or kind of a movie geek, maybe you get the reference. So this is from the early 60s and the late 60s. Uh, there's this famous movie, um, 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is maybe my favorite movie of all time. It's a love and hate movie though. You either love it or you hate it because there's lots of periods of boredom in it. Uh, and there's also this machine in it called the HAL 9000, uh, which is not only a talking machine, but it's a thinking machine that it controls everything in a spaceship that's headed out to Jupiter and it goes crazy and tries to kill people. And it sounds like this. Yeah, so that's when they try to shut Hal down at the end of the movie. It's, it's kind of sad. Uh, but he, um, there's lots of kind of inside joke references there. So I'm assuming that Stanley Kubrick, the director of the movie, was basically making a joke about this earlier. Uh, version of Cascade Synthesis when he was getting Hal to sing um, Daisy like that. Uh, I guess I'll point out here uh, something I didn't mention before, but obviously this form of synthetic speech is able to tweak F0, right? That's how you get the different notes for the song. It won't be a stylish marriage. I can't afford a carriage, but you look sweet up on the seat of a bicycle made for two. Yeah, so how much fun is that? Um, the rivalry between the parallel and cascade camps continued into the 1970s. Um, it turned out that cascade synthesizers were kind of better at producing vowels, and they also required fewer control parameters, but uh, they were bad with nasal stops and fricatives. The parallel synthesizers were better with the nasals and fricatives, but not as good with the vowels. I guess it's easier to make vowels if you do it one form and after the other rather than splitting them all up. Either way, um, there was another famous phonetician slash engineer named Dennis Clapp who proposed a synthesis of the two uh, by the late 70s uh, and kind of he earned himself eternal phonetic fame for that reason. So his system was known as Clat Talk. Um, and I'll show you a demo here of, or at least a diagram um, of what his system uh, did. Uh, so 
there's again kind of a source element to this where you're generating either some periodic pulses or noise for fricatives and then it goes through this relatively complicated set of pathways to get through various filters before it becomes speech at the far end um, these are different formants here maybe this is some sort of either noise or nasalization i don't know exactly um, but it works kind of like a combination of those previous two systems that we saw before i'm not going to waste your time with all the details especially when i don't understand them all that well um, this has well i'll let you know what it sounds like Text-to-speech systems are beginning to be applied in many ways, including aid for the handicapped, medical aids, and teaching devices. The first kind of aid to be considered is a talking aid for the vocally handicapped. According to the American Speech and Hearing Association, there are over one million people in the United States who are unable to speak for one reason or another. Yeah, so that voice might sound familiar because, like I said, this became very influential. He published it first as Clat Talk, and one of the things he did when he published it is that he published the code, basically, for how to produce it. Um, and because of that, it was sort of easy to replicate, and a lot of people picked up the ball and ran with it. Uh, however, it was also um, turned into something proprietary by the uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC, uh, and was eventually converted into something they sold as DEC Talk. Uh, and I think still do to this day. Um, so you may recognize this. Like I said, they used to play announcements for the C-Train network um, at C-Train stations using this voice. Text-to-speech systems are beginning to be applied in many ways. Uh, and what I've been told from people who knew Dennis Klatt is that uh, because he was kind of basing this uh, system on how he spoke himself, he was his own model. Uh, when you listen to this voice, it sounds like him. Including aid for the handicapped, medical aids, and teaching devices. Um, however, you may also recognize it as the form of synthesis that was used as Stephen Hawking's voice, um, the famous physicist. Uh, it became a bit of a, a trademark for him, I guess you could say as well. Uh, he adopted it in the 80s, shortly after it was developed, and he just kept using it for the rest of his life for 30 plus years afterwards. Um, yeah, so that's cool. Um, one of the things that uh, was an improvement in the Clat Talk system over previous speech synthesis systems was um, how he produced the source sounds. Uh, so there's kind of a variety of different um, waveforms here, like EGG waveforms that were used in the system. Uh, one of the things this kind of shows is that you kind of have to add some noise to the voicing source in order to get it to sound more human-like. I think I mentioned something like that before when I was talking about how when people develop synthetic speech, they thought they could create super speech, uh, which was better than natural speech, excuse me, um, and kind of got rid of all the uh, distracting noise and lip smacks and whatever else that we produce when we actually produce speech. Um, sort of with the same mindset, like that there's some sort of invariant core that we're trying to express when we produce speech that will sort of maximally benefit listeners who are trying to understand what we're saying. Um, by this point, when Dennis Klatt was developing the system, though, uh, he'd started to figure out, or one of the things he figured out, I guess, is that the variability that we actually get in natural speech is, is good. It's something that perceivers want to use. They want it to be there. Um, it not only helps them understand what's being said, but it makes it sound more human as well. Um, people will generally always prefer natural speech to synthetic speech and listening experiments, both just as a matter of preference, and they will also be able to understand the natural speech better than um, synthetic speech as well. Um, be that as it may, when you can control a system like this, you can control what the different, vo like you can generate different voices for the system by changing uh, what sort of the voice quality parameters do and what the F0 range is, that sort of thing. So Dennis Clad developed different voices for Clat Talk or what became Deck Talk uh, and kind of marketed them with these, I guess, somewhat clever names. Uh, so here's Perfect Paul. I am Perfect Paul, the standard male voice. And here's Beautiful Betty. I am Beautiful Betty, the standard female voice. Some people think I sound a bit like a man. Yeah, and maybe she does because, again, Dennis Klatt was basing all this on uh, how his understanding of his own voice. Um, so female voices um, in this system didn't sound super great. 
uh, and they can be a bit challenging to replicate to the extent that they might have sort of this breathy noise in them. Um, but female voices, as we found, uh, have become more creaky over the years, so that might be a bit easier to replicate. Who knows? Um, here's some other voices. I am the standard male voice. Perfect call. This is the result of trying to imitate a female voice by increasing the pitch, reducing the head size, and lengthening the open quotient. Yeah, don't know how convincing that is. Probably not. I am Hugh Terry, a very large person with a deep voice. I can serve as an authority figure. Yeah, well, maybe you should use more creaky voice, Hugh Terry. My name is Kit the Kid, and I am about 10 years old. Do I sound like a boy or a girl? Yeah. So there you go, there's lots of fun you can have with that um, once you're able to start uh, creating your own voices from scratch. Uh, yeah, this is another point I mentioned when we were talking about um, different voice quality measures, but jitter and shimmer are things you want to include in your voice source waveforms as well uh, to again make them sound a little bit more natural because people are just not electronically perfect like this. Um, another form of format synthesis, which was developed in the 70s, is known as linear predictive coding. And I'm calling it format synthesis, but it kind of works in a slightly different way. Uh, it's known as LPC for short, and this is still around. Um, you can see it. Uh, it's actually part of how Prot generates synthetic speech. Um, here's an example of what it sounds like. Now spell one as in one word. O N E correct. Yes. So um, this is probably not familiar to you, but it's definitely familiar to me because uh, uh, I was a kid when this toy came out called Speak and Spell. Uh, and that, that little clip you heard was just one example of uh, the game you could play with uh, this machine, which would just like show little words for you, like, or, or like it would say the words for you, uh, and then you were supposed to spell them. So you would like type in the uh, words using this keypad. It's got the vowels in yellow and the consonants in green, or orange, sorry. Uh, and then they would appear in green on the screen here and they would let you know if you got it right or not. Uh, so it's kind of a fun way to learn how to spell. Um, this toy is no longer cool, or at least it hasn't been for at least 35 years. Uh, but if you've ever watched the movie E.T., it plays a role in that movie, which is kind of fun. Uh, so you might be familiar with it through that. Um, however, uh, so LPC synthesis doesn't sound super great. Um, it's workable. You can get it to work well enough for a game like this. Uh, and one of the reasons it was popular sort of at this point in time was that it was cheap. Um, it had a very small footprint, you might say, uh, in terms of how much um, memory or com computational capacity it had to use to work. Uh, so one of the ways it works is that it reduces the amount of information in speech. Uh, and I have a number of notes. Oh, yeah, so you can go to this site if you want to play around with something like this. Um, I have a number of notes. There's actually a few slides in here, which I've never really presented in class because they're more complicated than we need to be. Uh, but kind of what um, LPC synthesis does, if you look at any specific waveform, um, you'll get kind of uh, a series of sample amplitude values that change over time. You can kind of think of this as like data plotted um, on the x-axis, like some form of amplitude data over, you know, change in time. Um, and what LPC synthesis does, it starts out by kind of creating a moving average of what these values are over time. So uh, we've seen a lot of this with data from the virus over the past few months where like say individual states or provinces or countries will report different numbers of virus cases over time. Uh, and then what a lot of news outlets will do is they'll say, well, at this point in time, we'll just take the average of the most recent five days uh, and then plot that average. And when you plot those averages uh, rather than the actual data, you get something which is a lot smoother than the original, but kind of shows you the overall pattern or shape um, in the original data. Uh, so I'm just going to mention that um, as kind of a useful statistical or data analysis point uh, and then not explain to you exactly how it goes through um, and sort of generates the synthetic speech. If you want to, you can look at these notes at home. Um, but it's basically trying to predict future points in the waveform on the basis of sort of the smooth um, 
values of the previous points. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to skip all this. I wasn't kidding. Uh, you can try to read through them if you want to. Um, and then we will just move on to um, something like this. So when you um, try to figure out what formant values are in Prot using Prot's automatic formant tracker, um, it's doing something like that smoothing function over on top of uh, the spectrum for a vowel uh, to give you sort of this overlaid smoother curve. Um, and the bumps in this smoother curve are where it thinks the formants are, right? Um, so this is not exact. It's sort of a reasonable way to guess at what the formants might be. But that's why um, Prot's formant tracker isn't super accurate all the time. Sometimes it's really nice and convenient. Uh, and if you have a huge amount of data to process, it can really be helpful if you get Prot to do it first before you take a look at it as a human being. But uh, generally speaking, as a human being who can see patterns pretty easily, um, you can kind of identify formats a little bit or more accurately and usually a little bit more easily than um, the Prot's formant tracker will. Uh, but this is called an LPC spectrum when you do that, uh, linear predictive coding spectrum. Same kind of principle that's used for like the speak and spell is used in Prot. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, right, this approach um, went out of style after the early 80s went past uh, because com computers started developing uh, more and more uh, processing power very quickly. Um, however, this has recently come back into fashion, and I'll show you an example at the tail end of this lecture about how Google, Google has used this to make some really high quality sounding synthetic speech. But otherwise, I'm not going to say anything more about it now. Instead, I'm going to move on to concatenative synthesis. Um, so up until about the 90s, uh, most synthetic speech was just based on format synthesis or maybe LPC synthesis. And then again, because of increases in computational power, uh, there was a new uh, that kind of opened up new opportunities, one of which was to use concatenative synthesis. Um, rather than sort of generating speech from scratch. <clears throat> I mentioned this at the top of the lecture, I'll just uh, state it again, but the idea with concatenative synthesis, one of these days I'm gonna get that word right, concatenative synthesis, is that you string together recorded samples of natural speech. So you sit down some speaker in a booth somewhere and you get high quality recordings of them saying basically whatever you want to be able to produce later, Normally, um, or at least the first attempts at this used what were called diphone synthesis. And what, would they, what they would do is they would get a speaker to record um, sequences of every possible phoneme to phoneme transition uh, in a language. And then they would splice up what they had recorded from the middle of one phoneme to the next of the uh, succeeding phoneme. Um, from the middle of one phoneme to the middle of the next phoneme, sorry. Uh, and then they would take that little chunk and then they just splice them all together um, to create whatever speech they wanted to have um, in the synthetic form later. So you can think about this as like taking, well, I have to take the end to k transition and concatenate it, and then also the k to a transition, and also the a to, well, flat transition, so on and so forth. You have all these little bits and pieces. You have a whole like database of these little bits and pieces, and then you develop a computer system which can kind of just splice them together on the fly uh, when you need to say the word concatenated. And that might probably work out better than me trying to say it. Who knows? Um, yeah, so the only way you can get this to work really is you have lots of computer memory. You have to be able to store all these bits and pieces in the mind of the computer so you can recall them later to put them together for the entire utterance that you want to produce. Um, which is why it took a while before, you know, computer um, processing technology was up to the task of doing this. <clears throat> Sorry. All right, um, so this is called diphone synthesis because you're going from the middle of one phoneme to the middle of the next. You're involving two phonemes there. Um, concatenated synthesis, because it has that natural source, tends to sound better than formant synthesis, which is what you're creating from scratch. So no matter what wonders Dennis Klatt was able to perform with his system, um, natural or concatenated synthesis will still sound a little bit better. The trick is um, getting 
sort of those transitions between the units and bits and pieces of concatenated synthesis to sound smooth when you put them together. Um, here's an early combination of LPC and diphone synthesis. You can let me know what you think about this. This paper describes a small real-time speech synthesizer. The synthesizer requires as its input a string of phonemes and the associated duration, pitch, and amplitude parameters. So that one still sounds a little bit like the speak and spell. Um, here is LPC plus demi syllable size chunks. So there's different ways to do this. You can take different units um, as your sort of primary um, found, I guess, atoms of uh, speech when you create one of these systems. So this is not diphone. It's not from one phoneme to the next. It's demi-syllable, which means half-syllable size chunks. Hello, I am a language interpreter named Lingua. I have been used to synthesize speech from demi-syllable by rule. Yeah, so that one doesn't sound too bad. Here are more recent efforts with what is called the Umbrella synthesizer. It would be a considerable invention indeed, that of a machine able to mimic our speech with its sounds and articulations. I think it's not impossible. Yeah, so Alice was beginning to get... All right. So you can see once you start to get to genuine concatenated synthesis, um, it, you, it sounds a lot more like a human being, even though you can still tell that there's something a little bit funny about it. J'ai été conçu dans les laboratoires de la faculté polytechnique de Mons. Ma voix est synthétisée grâce à un nouvel algorithme de synthèse appelé MBRola. J'ai été conçu dans les laboratoires de la faculté polytechnique de Mons. Yeah, so that's obviously in French for those of you who are French speakers out there. Um, but uh, this has become an influential method of producing th synthetic speech, and it's obviously been applied to a lot of different languages. But again, in order to um, construct this for a different language, what you really need is original recordings in that language, which you can splice together after the fact. Um, you can also check out the Macintosh Pro synthesizer. So this is built into any Macintosh. Um, took me a little while to find it because they've changed the uh, settings on my new computer. But if you go to system preferences in your Mac and then click on accessibility, um, there's an option for speech here. Uh, and you can tweak this so um, there's a couple things here so you can there's different voices you can use um, and you can use different speaking rates uh, like I said um, Darren Flynn listens to uh, text-to-speech synthesis a lot uh, just by having a computer play uh, whatever book he wants to read for him uh, and oftentimes when you want to listen to synthetic speech you want to listen have it speaking to you at a very fast rate um, because you can process it that quickly. So here's the default voice for the Macintosh Pro synthesis, just speaking at a normal voice. Most people recognize me by my voice. And here it is speaking fast. Most people recognize me by my voice. You can do it slow. Most people recognize me by my voice. Yeah, um, and it has different accents too, which is kind of fun. Uh, here's Fiona, the Scottish speaker. Hello, my name is Fiona. I am a Scottish English voice. Yeah, not bad. Um, you can also, it has an option here for speaking selected text when you press a specific key combination. Um, let's just try it here. Also check out the Massentalk Pro synthesizer. Yeah, not too bad, huh? Um, just any sort of text you want. Concatenated synthesis tends to sound more natural than formant synthesis. Yeah, so isn't that cool? And it's kind of always been there. Um, we'll go back to the default. Uh, what does customize do? Um, now you can't create your own voice. Anyways, uh, in theory, you can create your own voice for this, right? You could just record yourself um, and then plop your own recordings into the system um, to get it to sound like you. Uh, so contemporary concatenative speech synthesis synthesizers will use what is called variable unit selection and the idea here is just record a huge database of speech and then play back, play back the largest unit of speech you can whenever you can so don't just use say uh, phoneme to phoneme transitions or demi-syllable sized units or what have you um, if you want to say contemporary concatenative speech synthesizers when you're having producing an, the system produce an utterance and you've recorded this somehow from your original database of speech, you can just grab that whole unit of speech and plop it in there. 
Um, I guess I should mention as well, going back to the die phone idea, uh, the idea was that um, this would help the concatenative synth system, concatenative symptom, yeah, I'm gonna give up. Uh, the idea was that this could help this form of synthesis um, with those transitions between different types of sounds, right? So it's hard to produce those transitions in a nice natural way. It's not nearly as difficult to produce um, a natural sounding transition in the middle of a phoneme of some sort. So going from sort of N to Na here, you're splicing in the middle of the N, right in the middle of that nasal murmur, and it's probably a lot harder to hear that splice uh, if it's just in the middle of a nasal murmur than if you're um, splicing it sort of in between a consonant and a vowel. Uh, but the fewer of those transitions you have in general, the better off it should sound, right? Because then you can just get more natural speech and less of sort of the splicing together effect. Um, so here's what this sounds when you can give this a shot. The morgue was cold because of the sharp, harsh wind. So there's a little bit of oddness there. Maybe I'll play these a little bit louder. The morgue was cold because of the sharp, harsh wind. Or this one. Today we will demonstrate various features of this system should it offers many options and is designed for use within a research group where many aspects of synthesis may be tested within the same environment. So you can hear some of those weird glitches as he goes through that one. Um, but overall, it sounds fairly decent, right? Um, and like I said, another thing you can do with this is that if you want to create a synthetic version of your own voice, you can simply record a lot of your own speech. Uh, and then it can be spliced back together into synthetic speech afterwards. Um, I just realized I have a meeting in like five minutes, so I should probably go to that. Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, so this is a system from a lab I visited a while back uh, that was um, doing this sort of thing to help people who had been diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, which is a motor disease through which you will sort of progressively lose motor abilities, including the ability to speak. So what they wanted to do is rather than like Stephen Hawking who just grab a deck talk voice, these um, speakers would have voices that sounded like themselves uh, because they had recorded their own voice before they lost the ability to speak and they could use a system like this to just make it sound like them. The Model Talker Speech Synthesis System is a revolutionary software package designed to benefit people who are losing or who have already lost their ability to speak. It allows people with ALS or other conditions to use a synthetic version of their own voice for communication or to choose a voice best suited to represent them. Yeah, um, so this is what the original speaker of that voice sounds like. Tell me what you think that I said. So I think you can recognize his voice in that. Um, here's another speaker using the same system. Tell me what you think that I said. Yeah. And here's the synthetic voice. The model talker speech synthesis system is a revolutionary software package designed to benefit people who are losing or who have already lost their ability to speak. It yeah, so it's not perfect, but you can identify that it's that person. Um, and then they can say anything that they might want to say. Uh, so there's lots of practical applications for this, obviously. Um, and I guess I can mention now that we live in the weird world of 2020 that you can probably easily imagine that you could take recordings of somebody else's voice who has not given you any permission to do anything with it uh, and then splice it together in this sort of fashion to get them to say whatever you want them to say, like some politician or what have you, because they uh, speak a lot and people record what they say a lot, right? Um, I've been talking a lot myself like I said, I just, I forgot I have a meeting here in a few minutes. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to splice this lecture together, I think, uh, and I'll record the final slides here in just a second. Um, but I'm gonna stop for now. So I'll see you again in a minute or two.